Humanist Perspective, presented by the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association, following on a few principles of humanism. We're committed to the use of science and reason for understanding the universe and for solving human problems. We're skeptical of untested claims of knowledge, but we're open to new ideas. We are concerned with securing justice and fairness in society and in ending intolerance and discrimination. We are committed to the total separation of religion and government. We affirm humanism as a realistic alternative to the theologies of despair and the ideologies of violence. We reject the concept of an afterlife and believe in living a full and rewarding life here and now. We value and respect each individual's right to judge and lead their lives according to their own position as long as it's respectful of other people living in a free society. We hope you enjoy today's program and others in the weeks to follow. Hello again, and thank you very much for watching our show. Today, my guests are two folks from the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary, and I'd like to introduce Dr. Lloyd Harsh and uh, Dr. Paige Brooks. And I'm reading here, uh, Dr. Harsh, it says that you are the director, uh, you're an associate professor of church history. And I'm reading about you, uh, uh, Dr. Brooks, which says that you are uh, Islamic studies professor. That is correct. Right. And theology. Mm -hmm. and, well, I would assume also, yes. since it's <laughs> the organization that you're associated with. Uh, and I, and I uh, contacted you, the, you folks to be on my show from an article that I read in the Times-Picayune uh, by Marilyn Stewart, whom you know well because her husband is also a professor out at the, the seminary. And, uh, and I read about, um, uh, about your classes, I guess, on uh, uh, chaplaincy. And she says, uh, Ministering in Caesar's House, a forum exploring the issues affecting today's chaplains. So that's what, where I first heard about you. Now, in order to, I guess, to uh, clarify where each of us is coming from, I, and I assume that you know that we as secular humanists mm -hmm. are great supporters of the constitutional separation of church and state religion staying out of government, government staying out of religion, which the U.S. Supreme Court has said that is what the Constitution says. What is your position on church-state involvement? I think uh, uh, Rick Warren, when he moderated the uh, uh, presidential debates back in 2008, had a, a great way of saying this. As, as Christians, we believe in the separation of church and state, but not in the separation of faith and politics. Uh, what that would mean would be that the, the church does not control the government. The church does not uh, dictate to the government uh, who should be the appropriate uh, leaders of our government. Now, as individuals, we can be involved in the, the uh, electoral process to run for government or to try and have our candidates, whoever that might be, uh, to be uh, elected. But uh, the, uh, the government does not support the church through taxes. It does not uh, decide which particular uh, religion or denomination is going to be the official one representing uh, the country. The way I like to describe it is, uh, in 2012, we've got the, the uh, Olympics coming up. And we will be inundated with commercials saying, buy a Ford F-150, the official truck of the U.S. Olympic team, or buy Charmin toilet paper, the, the official. Now, that's because they've paid money in order to get that endorsement. Yes. But should the government decide, you know, we actually own shares in General Motors. We're going to decide that General Motors is going to be the official representation because we have decided. Uh, no one else has an opportunity to get that. Right. Uh, that would be an endorsement or an establishment of a particular auto brand as representing the government. 
so with the separation, the government needs to completely stay out of how a person believes, what a person believes, and how they practice their faith up to the point where a person's uh, actions would be infringing upon the rights of others, such as human sacrifice or any kinds of other Which things. Which is where the legal system comes in. Exactly. All right. Now, you just said that government should stay out of, out of your churches. How about the churches staying out of government? Well, that would depend on how you would understand churches staying out of government. When you look at the First Amendment, uh, it says that government, the restrictions are on government. The government shall make... Uh, 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 to pass the, uh, yes. uh, establishing, Esta yeah, establishing right. a church. Uh, All right, well, but it, it, that First Amendment is not crystal clear, but the United States Supreme Court decision on it some decades ago right. was very clear, and it said that uh, in no way should the government in any way involve itself in churches and religious matters, and vice versa, in no way should religion in any way uh, 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 be uh, 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 participate in government or, or even being uh, acknowledged by government. It was a total separation. Now you're saying that that you don't you don't interpret it that way. Am I is, am I getting this correctly? Well, it's. I'll go back to Thomas Jefferson. Uh, when he wrote to the Danbury Baptists uh, uh -huh. in January of 1802, yes. uh, the, the historical context was that the Danbury Baptists were, look, or, were wanting to give greetings to the newly elected president, and they were, as, in a sense, looking for support for the disestablishment of the church in Connecticut. Yes. Just because the federal government said there would be a no, no establishment of religion, uh, both with the, uh, the Constitution, with the uh, Article 6 that said there would be no religious test, uh, most Baptists didn't think that went far enough, and that's why we have, and why they argued for uh, the First Amendments uh, that came through uh, for a guarantee of religious liberty uh, that came with the Bill of Rights in 1791. But just because we had uh, the, 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 uh, those guarantees didn't mean, at the federal level, didn't mean that the states disestablished their churches. Connecticut did not disestablish the, the Congregational Church until 1818. Mass, or New Hampshire in 1819 and Massachusetts was the last to disestablish its state church in 1833, 50 years after we'd been a country. All right, but what did Thomas Jefferson say in his letter? In his letter he responded saying, uh, you know, in their help, uh, but that there should be an, a wall of eternal separation between, between church a, and state. A wall of separation. That's right. All right. Uh, that they, the two entities should remain separate and going about their business, uh, not dictating to the others. Well, aside from dicta dictating, my understanding from the Supreme Court is that there should be no involvement, aside from dictating it, just zero involvement. That is uh, our understanding of, of, of that provision in the Constitution. You're saying that maybe there's some, some wiggle room there? Well, that same Thomas Jefferson uh, responded to a letter from New Orleans. Uh, after the Louisiana Purchase, uh, the Ursula Nuns here in New Orleans wrote the president wanting to get guarantees that they had rights to their property. And you can understand that, that if the go you know, prior governments to Louisiana believed in a state church, and they had used state money to provide the Ursulines with the convent and the schools that they had. Right. And so they were wanting guarantees from the, American, the new American government that was now over them that they would have the right to own and operate their schools and have right to their property. Okay. And so they wrote to the president and he wrote back to them uh, a copy of a, of a letter uh, that he dated uh, uh, May 15, 1804. And he assured them that regardless of uh, the different kinds of religious backgrounds of the United States, that they would be free to practice their faith and to go about doing uh, their good work uh, as uh, educators. And he uses this phrase. Um, he says, whatever the diversity of shade may appear in the religious opinions of our fellow citizens, the charitable objects of your institution cannot be indifferent to any and its furtherance of the wholesome purposes of society by training up its younger, num younger members in the way they should go cannot fail to ensure it the patronage of the government it is under. Be assured it will meet all the protection my office can give it. That's well, the same Thomas Jefferson. I hear what you're saying and that word patronage could support your position. Now, well, our, no, by patronage, what, I'm, what I understand you to meaning is that 
the wall of separation uh, deals with authority over, not interaction with. All right. Well, uh, the Supreme Court said that this wall of separation was absolute, that there should be no involvement. And I didn't bring the quotation from, right. from the Supreme Court. But I'm looking at uh, something that's attributed to you, which it says that um, uh, Lloyd Harsh uh, said, the Judeo-Christian values and ideals upon which this country was founded mm -hmm. are no longer assumed but challenged by an increasingly diverse society. Now, our position is that this country was not founded on religious principles. Our Constitution is totally uh, uh, without religion. The only reference to religion in the Constitution is the prohibition mm -hmm. you know, that you, there should be no religious test for holding an office, and then the First Amendment, which uh, includes the uh, wall of separation. So how do you explain that, uh, that uh, this country was, was based on the Judeo-Christian values? Well, if you look at the documents from the early founders, they talk about uh, a creator, they talk about the values of integrity, uh, they'll write in some of the Federalist Papers about uh, the necessity of recognizing, um, the, uh, I'll just use the shorthand, recognizing uh, God's existence and the impact that that has in the lives of its citizens as foundational to uh, maintaining the character of individuals necessary for the furtherance of a republic. Yes. I do understand that prior to the final execution of the Constitution, uh, there was much, much discussion and, and, and they had not at that point decided that religion did not have a part in government. Mm -hmm. But the Constitutional Convention wrote a totally secular rule of governance, which is our Constitution. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure there was much discussion and debate and compromise, but they came up with one that had no reference to religion and faith. Correct. Now, if it's in there subtly, which is, I assume, sort of your position, that uh, I'm just clarifying the difference from your perspective and our perspective, because from our perspective, it, you know, it's just, it's not there. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, uh, and I'm sure you know this story, that, that the, during the, uh, the uh, Constitutional Convention when uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin suggested that they bring in a minister to open each of their sessions, he proposed it. As, mm -hmm. as, uh, and uh, it died for the lack of a second and it never happened. So mm -hmm. they conducted this whole thing uh, in a secular manner. Now, so having established that we may not see eye to eye on that aspect of us, of it, tell us now about your, whatever it is you are planning or proposing and hoping regarding chaplaincy in government, including the military. Well, for uh, the chaplaincy, the chaplaincy is actually a, a um, strange mix of politics, religion, military, um, policy coming together in, in a context where um, we provide and perform religious services for the people in the military. And so... For the, excuse me, for the religious people in the military. For any person who wants it in the military, let's put it that way. All right. um, because oftentimes you'll have uh, chaplains that will perform non-religious duties just as a part of their um, duty as being an officer in the military. Uh, sometimes we're called upon to do um, other things that, that we might have to do, which affects everyone in the military. And that's a fine line between um, my, because I serve as a chaplain uh, in the Army Reserve, um, that my role as an officer, as a commissioned officer, and my role as a chaplain. Uh, so I serve a dual role there to perform or provide and also to carry out uh, the, the president's orders and my commander's orders, everything else. Uh, so yeah. our position is that, that chaplains should be allowed in the military for whatever uh, religious needs might be there and those specific chaplains representing those specific needs. All uh, right, well... My uh, uh, American Heritage Dictionary definition of chaplain says, mm -hmm. a member of the clergy, 
attached to a chapel, legislative assembly, or military unit. Mm -hmm. So uh, chaplains are, by definition, members of the clergy. Right. Now, let me tell you why we have a serious problem with chaplaincy in the military and in government, but specifically, and this has become a, a big topic of conversation in the secular areas. This is a very recent uh, edition of the Free Inquiry magazine, and, uh, and uh, this is the uh, executive director of the Council for Secular Humanism, and he said, the, the title says, Humanist Chaplains in the Military, A Bridge Too Close. He's questioning that. Here's what he says. First, Let's look at the context. Department of Defense statistics list 9,400 atheists and agnostics among America's 1.4 million active duty military mm -hmm. personnel. That means they outnumber active duty Jews, Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists. Mm -hmm. But a whopping 285,000 service members claim no religious preference. No one knows how many of these nuns are truly non-religious, mm -hmm. though surveys of the general population suggest that 50 to 66 percent of civilian nuns fall into the category of being non, you know, of, of being atheists. So we're probably talking about a non-religious population well into the six figures, a major and growing fraction of all Americans in uniform. Mm -hmm. Now, if those people have the people who the military people who would come to you as a chaplain have some problem of some sort that they want to discuss with you, these people, these uh, six fig, you know, mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of people, have no one to go to. Mm -hmm. They don't need religious uh, advice. They need psychological counseling. Mm -hmm. And they can't, and they don't get it. They don't get it. Now, the, this article is about a movement to have to have secular chaplains, right. which is an oxymoron, <laughs> yes. or humanist chaplains. Mm -hmm. You know, Harvard University has a humanist chaplain. Did you mm -hmm. know that? Yeah. It's an oxymoron because the definition of humanism is the, uh, with a capital H is, you know, the, no reliance upon the supernatural. So I think they couldn't be called chaplains, but Shouldn't this large portion of the military have someone they could go to? Well, I think it, it comes in understanding the roles of chaplains, the roles of counselors, psychologists, and other personnel in the military. So let me kind of give you a, a brief history of that. All right. So um, as chaplains, our role is to, um, yes, first of all, represent my religious denomination. Um, to those who are members of that religious denomination. Yes. It's my primary function. My, another function I have is to be a chaplain or, or what we might term a counselor, not a, a fully licensed or trained counselor, but a religious counselor to, to anyone who might want it. Now, a lot of times, yes, you, you have the, 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 the non-religious preference that sometimes soldiers will put down on their record. Yes. And that goes down their first official personnel record. Yes. And, and you're correct to note that just because they put no preference doesn't mean that they're not religious, but then it might not mean that they are religious. So we just don't know. I know. Um, now, back, let me just interrupt for a minute. Mm -hmm. Back many, many years ago when I was drafted into the Army and yeah. they asked me my religion, I said, none. Mm -hmm. They stamped my dog tag P for Protestant. Right, exactly. And you gotta, they, don't, they don't do that anymore, but right. they did at that time. And you have to understand... Fortunately, you know, I was not in the war, and I didn't get killed, and they didn't have to pray over my body. Right. <laughs> Go you ahead. Know, when, a lot of times when these soldiers come in, they ask you that. It's <laughs> some lowly personnel sergeant that uh, that doesn't know all the technical distinctions, and so they'll just put whatever, because they got to do their job and get it done. Yeah. Um, but also as a part of my role as a chaplain, it is to um, provide a, a presence and a help for any soldier that might be out there. So that's why we, we have a, a two phrases, at least in the Army chaplaincy that we use. One is perform or provide, and the other one is cooperation without compromise. And what that means is that I either perform it, a religious service, as much as I can, up until the point that it, it might compromise my doctrine or convictions, or I will provide someone else who can for that person. So say a, a Catholic comes up to me, 
wants mass. I can't perform mass because I'm a Protestant, but I will get a Catholic chaplain to them. It might not be within 24 hours, but it would be very, very soon so that they can have mass. Um, so that's what we mean by perform or provide. Cooperation without compromise means that I acknowledge I'm in a pluralistic setting and that I have to work with others as much as I can up to a certain point, again, without compromising my convictions or even making another person compromise theirs because we are in a pluralistic setting. Now, there, there, there are two landmark cases for chaplaincy from the Supreme Court uh, that talk about the unique role of the, of the military context. And I think that, ha that, that really has to be understood. In, well, in our discussion. Uh, one goes back to um, the 1963 ruling by the Supreme Court about school prayer. Um, that was not part of the, the primary case being argued, but the justices did note that the military provides a unique context for that, um, for chaplains being allowed in the military. But then a, a, a more clear, or clearer ruling, I should say, more technical ruling came in 1985 in one of the Supreme Court cases where, it talked, where they said that Army chaplains can have a role in the military um, because of the unique context of the military. The Free Establishment Clause allows a person to exercise their religious freedom without any limitations from the government. Well, because of military duty and because of places where we send people, that exercise of religion might be prohibited. So in that case, chaplains are there to actually make sure that they can exercise their religion if they want to. So our primary role as a chaplain, and they, they, they teach us this and indoctrinate um, us with this in the chaplain schoolhouse, is that we are there to actually um, encourage the, the establishment clause. We are there to help protect religious freedom uh, in the, the unique context of the military. You can't grab a, uh, any minister off the street and go places where I went last year with my soldiers over in Iraq with uh, the, the situations we had, with the convoys we were on, with the situations that we had breaking out. And so it does take a specially trained clergy to be in those contexts, uh. not to force my religion on anyone, but for those that do want to exercise their religion to allow I them understand. to practice. No, so that's so that's kind of the, the 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 position that we would come from saying we're not there to inhibit religion, we're actually there to provide for the free exercise. I understand that. And yeah. and a big part of what you do is to provide a, a sensitive ear to people Very with true. problems. Mm -hmm. Now let me tell you I'll read to you more from this particular article. He says, here's how it works if you're in uniform. Having an emotional problem, and in in our military people over in Afghanistan and Iraq are having increasing numbers of emotional problems right. and mm -hmm. suicides and whatever else. He says, having emotional problems, money trouble, marital strife, anxiety, the deck is stacked in favor of your talking it over with the chaplain. First, the chaplain is easily accessible. Getting to see a therapist can take, can take doing. Second, discussions with the chaplain are protected by clergy confidentiality. Mm -hmm. Your commanding officer will not learn that you sought help, and the visit won't go into your personnel file. Third and most worrisome, unlike a counseling session with a chaplain, a service member's request for secular mental health services is the opposite of confidential. Not only must it be reported up the chain of command, but the request alone, to say nothing of actually utilizing mental health services, can be grounds to modify a security clearance or end a military career. Mm -hmm. Now what are these non-religious people to do when they have, you know, some serious emotional mental problems? Uh, and they don't uh, find that, find that uh, discussing it with a Baptist mm -hmm. chaplain is the way to go. Sure. They've well, been seriously discriminated against. Yeah, and, and let, me, let me provide some balance here because first of all, uh, it doesn't mean they're going to be totally discriminated against. Uh, second of all, a lot of it is anecdotal evidence that, that he's pulling out uh, from there. But then, but then third is that uh, there can be situations in which uh, Counseling can be arranged for people who want to have a totally secular worldview in their counseling. Now, when if a person were to come to me and ask me, 
um, and say, hey, I'm not a religious person. Um, I still don't have any problem trying to help them, trying to counsel them as much as I can. In that type of context, I'm not going to force my religious views on them. Okay? Uh, I and now, understand. I personally don't have a problem right. doing that. Some chaplains might because they might be uh, more religiously grounded in their counseling than other chaplains. Okay. So it all depends. But if a person came and they did want, um, say, confidential counseling or something of that nature from a more secular perspective, yeah. it can be arranged in those uh, understand. It says it can be arranged. Now, right. uh, Dr. Harsh, I wanted to say that we're about to run out of our, of our time, and I would like to have a little discussion about chaplaincy not in the military, okay. including in our, our uh, New Orleans City Council has a chaplain, and the, the uh, 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 Congress has a chaplain, all of which we consider unconstitutional. Huh? So talk a little bit about chaplaincy non-military. Well, chaplains, there are chaplains in the workplace, there are chaplains in hospitals and other locations. Uh, Oftentimes they are funded from outside sources. In hospitals they are funded through the hospital uh, system. Uh, where the challenge becomes with that is when you have significant uh, government money that goes into a hospital system, you want to make sure you uh, deal with a non-establishment component while providing uh, service to the, the people who are coming. Uh, the reasons they are bringing those chaplains in is that, particularly in the workplace, that's a growing place for chaplaincy, is, is corporations are discovering that there are people within their, who are their employees uh, who have religiously oriented issues and questions that they wish to have discussed, and they find it beneficial to the company to have them dealt with uh, before yes. they become larger. And yes. so that's but why I'm, they would bring I'm more concerned with the chaplains in government, uh, uh, government right. uh, organizations rather than private industry. And uh, I, don't, uh, I don't know whether they're paid or not. Is, is the chaplain for the uh, uh, city council here, is, is, is that a paid position or, or not? I, I do not believe that's a paid position. Well, because you see, I, I don't know whether you're aware of it, but I have on several occasions gone to the city council and opened the meetings with a secular invocation, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, in the first time around was not easy to do, but, but I've now done that four times. And people want to know, well, you know, what do you invoke? Who do you invoke? Well, I invoke the Constitution and, mm -hmm. and you know, reason and science and, uh, and, and free, then the First Amendment mm -hmm. uh, uh, to provide us with a good council meeting and to provide them, you know, with, with the basis for making good judgment. So, uh, uh, and I just wonder why they need... Um, prayers in order to, to, to function as a good lawmaking body. Well, the worldview that you're expressing is one that, that doesn't recognize a spiritual dimension uh, to life that is necess uh, necessary to human uh, kind. We have a trouble distinguishing spiritual from religious. Right. Well, <laughs> and you know, from my worldview there is a definite uh, dimension to that. Yes. And uh, that it's important to recognize that and to involve that as part of the world in which we live. And so if we want to make good decisions, and from my worldview, if, if God does exist, wouldn't uh, you know, it would be important to seek his guidance and his uh, uh, direction for making wise decisions for our, our city council. Well, and they've been opening the legislative sessions in, in Congress with prayers, and uh, look, what, look what they're doing for us, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> they're not listening, obviously. <laughs> Some, someone's not listening. <laughs> Uh, let me just ask you this, because we, we really just touched the surface. Would you folks be willing to come back f uh, for another taping at another time? And mm -hmm. we can pick, mm -hmm. because there, there's still a lo lot that I would like to talk to you all about. Mm -hmm. And so we could look forward to that. Yes. And I want to thank you folks who are watching our show and hope you will be with us again and often. Mm -hmm.